It's the Progress Pod, a production of the Franklin County Coalition for Progress. I'm Pete Mazzoni. A quick programming note before we get started today. We had scheduled a conversation with Wilson College sociology professor Julie Rowley, but unfortunately, the weather had other ideas in mind this week. So look for that in the near future. On today's show, we are lucky enough to have Ann Hull from the Franklin County Historical Society. In honor of Women's History Month, we are going to hear a story about a local woman who made a difference, not just to our area, but to our nation, by helping to transform modern nursing and the 19th Amendment. And with that, I will turn it over to the historian. Thanks for being here, Ann. Uh, Ann has prepared a text to share with us, so if you just want to go ahead and get started, uh, we're ready. Okay, thank you very much, Pete. Um, I'd like to talk about Lavinia Dock today because she was uh, a very inspiring woman who came from um, our community. Lavinia was born uh, into an extremely distinguished family in Harrisburg in 1858. She worked as an educator, a settlement worker, historian, author, pacifist, and radical suffragist, even though she was anti-war. She was a, a pacifist. The second of six children, whose family descended from Pennsylvania Germans, Hicksite Quakers, and French Huguenots. They were financially secure, and the children were raised in the comfortable culture of the time. But our focus will be on Lavinia. Lavinia attended a girls' academy in Harrisburg um, and when she was young, and she became a near professional pianist at age 17. She caught the ear and the eye of a Polish violinist who remarked that she would make a good wife. In Lavinia's autobiographical sketch, she responded to that. Something in his manner conveyed a sense of inferiority. In a flash, I seemed to see my freedom gone, myself a household drudge, and no way out. I said to myself, I never will. And that impression stayed with me all my life. By the age of 24, Lavinia decided to enter the nursing field, much to the dismay of her family, especially her father. Nursing had been in the hands of prostitutes who were given the choice of either prison or hospital work. And of course, they chose hospital work. So legends such as Florence Nightingale and Clara Barton, um, who later founded the Red Cross, became a good friend of Lavinia's. And both of them inspired her to take on this nursing challenge. She graduated in 1886 from Bellevue Nursing School, where she worked. She then went to Florida during the yellow fever epidemic and in Johnstown after the flood. She worked at Johns Hopkins School of Nursing, and they later attempted to name the school after her, but she kind of declined. She was a very self-effacing person. During this time, she authored Materia Medica, for nurses because nothing had been written at the time and she wanted the nursing profession to be improved and that they would the nurses would know exactly um, what medicines to give their patients uh, which was very lacking at the time. In 1896 she decided to join Lillian Wald's Henry Street Settlement House in the tenements of New York to promote the welfare activities community and preventative health programs, and to care for the immigrants. Success followed because of the hygiene systems that were put in place by all the nurses there. She later wrote that, I never began to think until I went to Henry Street. There she organized the Women's United Garment Workers of America. She attended socialist meetings and joined the Women's Trade Union League. She attempted to vote once, but was arrested. However, Teddy Roosevelt was the police commissioner in New York at the time, and he refused to jail her. She played a pivotal role by joining the International Council of Nurses and became its secretary, and she traveled around the world 
pushing this International Council of Nurses. Um, she founded the American Journal of Nursing, and she wrote scholarly works on nursing, including the history of nursing, which had become, for decades and decades, the standard reference book. Lavinia was convinced that only women's suffrage could end the abuses of the industrial society, which she saw every day in the, in the tenements of New York. So on a trip abroad in 1912, she met Emmeline and Christabel Pankhurst in London, where she learned all about the English uh, suffrage movement, which was extremely militant. The Pankhurst women were known for blowing up mailboxes and um, blowing up windows, and she uh, learned from that. So the next year, she operated a suffrage newsstand in New York City, and she conducted rallies in the Italian Quarter. And in 1913, she joined the Great March with Mother Rosalie Jones from Albany to Washington. The July 1915 issue of the New York Times gave space to Lavinia and the Irish suffragette Margaret Hinchy. They were depicted as the two trench women who descended deep into the subway excavations to interview the longshoremen. Every day between 12 and 1.30, they carried Irish, Italian, German, English, and Yiddish leaflets and asked the men there to vote for suffrage for the women, to vote so their, their wives could have suffrage. Lavinia's militancy was not accepted in the nursing profession or in social reform circles, and she was obliged to resign from the Henry Street Settlement House, although she did remain friendly with Lillian Wald. In 1917, she arrived in Washington to participate in a massive drive to add the Susan B. Anthony Suffrage Amendment to the Constitution. She already held membership in the Women's Party Advisory Council and was a correspondent and a board member of their newsletter, The Suffragists. In June 1917, she wrote about the youthful pickets in front of the White House and the Capitol, where men sit who enjoy the rights they deny to women at the gates. The title of this article was The Youth Are at the Gates. Quoting her article, I'm quoting her article, can it be possible that any brain cells not totally crystallized could imagine that giving a stone instead of bread would answer the demands of women who, because they are young, fearless, eager, and rebellious, are fighting and winning a cause for women. That is a losing fight. The old stiff minds and selfish minds must go. Obstructive reactionaries must move on. The young are at the gates. And that's where I compare this coming weekend with what, what is happening. It's, it's very comparable with what's happening with the young this weekend marching. They're marching at the gates on Saturday. Um, to get back to her, um, on June 27th, she was privileged to be one of the first six American women imprisoned for suffrage activities. She was jailed three separate times for carrying a banner and a flag in front of the White House, a behavior described by the court as unpatriotic and almost treasonable. Her longest sentence was 30 days. However, she did, she did uh, have more than that, but the longest one sentence was 30 days, and it was in the Virginia uh, infamous Occoquan workhouse where those women were force-fed, particularly Alice Paul. She was a militant, and she had, had partnered with um, Lavinia. I'm not sure that Lavinia was force-fed, but she did testify later that she found it hard work choking down enough food to keep life in while she was there. She, she shocked her journal readers in 1921 by advocating birth control and praising Margaret Sanger for teaching poor women what other women may learn if they wish to. The next year, at age 64, because of illness, she was forced home to the mountains at Caledonia, at Dockwood, um, to join her sisters, 
Her older sister, Myra Lloyd, who was the eminent environmentalist horticulturalist. Her sister, Laura, who was deaf, but she was a great artist. And Emily was a wonderful violinist. There was another sister named Margaret who died earlier, but she seemed to be the housekeeper. Uh, Lavinia continued her correspondence and her writing, painting, and playing the piano until age 98 when she died in the Chambersburg Hospital in 1956. Her legacy includes that of nursing reform, early social work, political activism, women's equality, a life of action, controversy, and one at that time on the cutting edge of social reform. Wow. <laughs> what a lady. Wow. Uh, that is, that's amazing. Do you mind if we ask a couple questions? No. Okay, great. <clears throat> so her family, um, coming from a family of prestige and rank and choosing the life she did, uh, what, did her family, how did they respond? Was she ostracized or... She was ostracized by society in Harrisburg. Mm -hmm. um, one socialite remarked, I thought the dock women were ladies. Ooh, and that was cutting <laughs> that was for the time. That was, a, that was a real put down. Right. And she came, she came from um, a fairly wealthy background. They were a preeminent family mm -hmm. in Harrisburg. Um, there were five sisters and one or two brothers. Um, I think she had an uncle who was a judge, a grandfather who was um, a doctor. Her brother became an eminent um, physician who did not live around here. Um, and they were taught to be ladies of that Victorian era. Mm -hmm. And they were to hold a social position. But Lavinia was kind of different from the beginning because when she was five, she wrote, she didn't care for dolls. She'd rather be outside. Um, she read incessantly, constantly reading. Um, she's a very brilliant person. And her sister was, her older sister, Myra Lloyd, was also a very brilliant woman. None of the sisters married. And so I think they kind of learned at that time that they would not have any freedom if they, if they married. That's very interesting. And it sounds like uh, there was a gene going through these women that was rejecting these social norms. I believe so. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. interesting. They were ahead, way ahead of their time. Oh, my gosh. That's an way understatement. Ahead of their time. Way ahead of their time. <laughs> so the uh, first husband, or the, the suitor that you mentioned, uh, that now was he handpicked by the family? or? No, I don't believe so. I believe she, since she was a wonderful pianist, mm -hmm. and she could have been a professional pianist, mm -hmm. um, and I, he may have heard her at a, a recital or something, um, Maybe he was her teacher at one point, mm -hmm. but the decision that she made was probably for the best. Yes, most definitely. Mm -hmm. Her career, this wouldn't have happened, I think, Nothing. if she had gotten married. Nothing would have happened like that if she had gotten married. Now, you, you mentioned something that shocked me, uh, that nursing was the province of prostitutes. Right. It was. I had no idea. Well, the court that was the court system at the time, you know... Um, the prostitutes were given the choice of, you know, hospital work or going to prison, and what would they choose? Hospital work. Right, every they time. Did, but they didn't know anything about nursing, so they would charge a fee. Mm -hmm. These ex-prostitutes would charge a fee to help patients in these, in these hospitals. Um, wow. Yeah, and so it was not a good thing. Um, Sometimes they were harming the patients more than sure, they were helping because they sure. didn't really know anything. But that was their way out of prison. Interesting. Yeah. Very mm -hmm. interesting. Um, as far as what she did for nursing, is there anything in particular that stands out in terms of her ability to reform nursing? I know she wrote this book, Materia Medica. She did, but she also helped write the history of nursing. It was like a five-volume mm -hmm. with uh, another nurse mm -hmm. um i think they were from johns hopkins mm -hmm. and uh it was they were standard textbook nursing um but i don't know if they still are today i don't know whether they're used today did she enter the nursing profession at, at the entry level do you know or did she well, come in with you know as administrative level i or? think she came in at administrative level she was older 
Mm-hmm. She was older. She wasn't young when she um, entered the nursing field. Mm-hmm. She she was probably close to thirty. Mm-hmm. You know, and she seemed to take on all these activities. You know, she she took on you know the suffrage movement. You know, when she was in her what forties or fifties, mm-hmm. she marched with the the Great March um, from Albany, New York, to Washington D.C. in 1913, and they took. They, they marched, and, and people were nasty and threw That's eggs right. and tomatoes at them along the way. Um, and when they got there, there were like 5,000 women marching in the streets of Washington. Wow. And this was the day that Wilson was to be inaugurated. <laughs> oh, my. So he held, a, <laughs> he held something over their head. I mean, he was sure. totally, totally opposed to um, uh, the, suf- the women's suffrage. Um, but they kept harassing him and harassing him, even to the point where um, in one of the State of the Union uh, messages he gave, they sneaked in um, and were on the upper level, the balcony, and, and left this banner flow of votes for women. And it caused su- such a sensation, you know, and they had to be taken out. Um, and so finally, I think after so many years, he was so tired of being harassed, he said, Okay, all right. They wore him down. Let's have a special session of Congress. <laughs> right, right. Now, before we, uh, before we got on um, the air, we were talking about the difference between the uh, suffragists in England versus the suffragists in the U.S. You mentioned that they were far more militant over there. They were. Did these groups collaborate in any way? Did they kind of feed off each other? I'm not, I'm not sure that they did that, but the American women learned from them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, the American women were learned to be more radical in their methods mm-hmm. uh, because this suffrage movement had you know, started in 1848 in Seneca Falls, New York, and it languished and languished and languished for years, mm-hmm. um, even though some of the states approved... Um, in the West, they were very progressive and they approved of women's suffrage. So some of the women could vote in like Wyoming. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the first um, woman was Jeanette Rankin and she was from Montana. And she is the one who introduced the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. Now was she, what, what, she was the first person, to, first woman I should say, to vote? The, no, there was another woman in, in um, Wyoming, I think, who I'm getting Wyoming and Montana mixed up here. There was another woman who actually could vote. Women were allowed to vote. Mm-hmm. I mean, and because the Western states were very progressive. But Jeanette Rankin was one of the first women in the um, House of Representatives, and she, um, you know, came from her state. And I, I can't remember if it was Wyoming or Montana, uh, but she's the one who introduced the Susan B. Anthony Amendment to the Constitution. So now in Engaging in all this radical activity, uh, what was her support system? Because if she's getting thrown in jail and she's marching, and how how was the movement, and her in particular, how did she support herself? Well, for one thing, over the years in nursing, she saved and invested a lot of money. Okay, so she was she could not do, just... She could do that. Right. But, the, but the movement had money. Um, I, I remember reading uh, about a Catherine... Russianberger from New York, and she she commissioned the liber- the women's justice bell, the Liberty Bell, mm-hmm. which moved especially through Pennsylvania, um, and so there was money behind the suffrage movement. Okay, because that, yeah, that's clearly going to be important. You know, I don't to... I don't think I think Alice Paul came Al, Alice Paul came from New Jersey, and I think she had I think she came from some money too. Okay, yeah, Al- These, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. These, these women who were from um, social bra- backgrounds that were above, you know, what the norm, working class people, they started getting involved in the reform movements. Mm-hmm. And they, they're the families that had money. Yeah, it, it seems that that's where the real energy came from. Now, you mentioned that social reform circles rejected her. In the beginning, they did. Now, what was because she was too radical for them, moving too quickly, or no? Because of the nursing, because the nurse, because nursing was thought of so poorly, Mm. you know. Except for Clara Barton and Florence Nightingale, 
you know, I keep bringing up the prostitute thing, um, but nursing was not thought of very highly. Interesting. And it was a, it was a degrading thing to be doing to going into nursing. So they held that against her as if it's another symbol of and lacking of status. Yes. Interesting. Yes. Despite what was, she was doing. Yes. So how did she uh, come to meet Alice Paul? Because Alice Paul is a very important figure uh, in, in the suffragist movement. She is. And I'm not quite sure how they met, but they kind of became partners because Alice was very um, radical. Was a very, and she had gone to, to England particularly just to learn from the Pankhurst women. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not quite sure, but, you know, uh, Lavinia was such a radical militant in this just in this suffrage, suffrage movement. And, um, and I believe that that's probably, it was another group that was more militant. There were two or three groups of suffrage associations. And of course, the one that I kept saying languished and languished and languished, I think that Lavinia got tired of that and she wanted to move on. She, she wanted, wanted action. This done and, and she wasn't afraid to pick it or, or whatever mm -hmm. she had to do. This became her life. Mm -hmm. She kind of gave up nursing to do this. And now the, I love this, that she attempted to vote. She did. She attempted to vote in New York. <laughs> now, where did she... Where did she uh, it would have to have been New York City. Okay, it was in New York because, City. It would be New... Yes, because, um, uh, because the police commissioner at the time was Teddy Roosevelt. Interesting. And uh, he refused to jail her. That's, that's fascinating. So she just kept trying over and over. She just walked up to the polling station. I guess. That's... Wow, <laughs> amazing. Now, as far as the, how did the press perceive her? Because she had to have been you know, extremely public figure. And do you have any idea how the, how the press treated her? I, I think from what I've read, um, they were fair to her. Oh, they interesting. Were fair. I wouldn't mm -hmm. have expected that. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I think they were. So she jailed three times and sent to At this, least. this prison in Virginia. Oh, it was well known. It was a terrible place to go. The Occoquan Workhouse. Mm -hmm. Terrible place to go. Obviously, that was probably hand-picked by the authorities to make sure Eventually. to inflict maximum punishment. Right. And Alice Paul, well, I, I read where she was beaten, as well as physically forced beaten. Fit, physically beaten. She was hung by her hands. Oh, my gosh. Um, she was force-fed. There are pictures of her being force-fed. Oh, my gosh. Unbelievable. Um, now, to the 19th Amendment, uh, when did that pass again? 1920, it was finally ratified. Mm -hmm. And were and, they and all present? or? I, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. I, I just have this picture of Alice Paul in front of the flag holding this glass of champagne, mm -hmm. declaring the 20th or the 19th Amendment. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and so the women could first vote for, I think, Cox and Harding. So they, they got their victory, and then after the amendment passed, what did Lavinia do from there? Did she find a new cause? You know, she marched. She was one of the women who marched from Albany to Washington, um, and she was known as the Surgeon General. They called her okay. Dr. Doc. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Doc. It was kind of cute. And these women um, wore um, cloaks as if they were pilgrims on their march. Oh, my gosh. It was, what it an was, image that uh, brings it, up. It's a great, st wonderful story. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's fascinating. Yeah. But evidently, she got ill on the way, and I'm not sure she finished. And, you know, the next thing I know, she's got some illness, and so she's coming home. And they may still have had a home in Harrisburg, but they also had some land and a house that Myra, Myra Lloyd, her, her older sister, bought a lot of land at Caledonia, lots of acreage, and planted all these wonderful trees. Now, you're at, saying Caledonia. Where, where specifically are you talking about? The mountains east of here, between here and... and oh, okay. Between here and Gettysburg. And Probably what we call the Michelle Forest at this point. Close to it, okay. yes, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yes, and she bought all this land. The home that they built is still standing. It is. You cannot see it from the road. It's on a hill behind trees. I think it's been turned into apartments, but it is still standing. And that whole area then was known, I guess, from there up to the top of the mountain, it was known as Dock Wood, Dock's Woods. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. And is there any plaque or anything noting 
the the area no but there is in harrisburg because myra lloyd her older sister devised the green circle um area around the city of harrisburg and the state uh has a plaque there for myra lloyd her older sister. there's a whole nother story in and of oh, itself <laughs> myra is enough she was on the she was the first faculty member at the forestry school at Monalto. really Yes. My gosh. But I, I don't know as much about her. I was more interested in Lavinia because of the suffrage movement. Sure. Myra, Myra may have been involved in it in a very small way because I think the area where they met was at what was known as the Grafenberg Inn, the Graf, Grafenberg Inn at the time. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of the center of the local suffrage movement. Okay. Uh, where they would bring, you know, the state representatives or. You know, like a, I think the national representative that came to came to Chambersburg was Dr. Anna Shaw, who was very involved. Uh, she was a minister, she was a physician, um, but she came to Wilson College because Wilson had a satellite organization of mm -hmm. the suffrage sure. movement. Well, that makes sense. And she spoke there. Mm -hmm. Was there local support for the suffragists? Oh, you're giving me a look. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was on the um, ballot on in 1915. But guess what? It was voted down right. in Franklin County. Oh, boy. However, Waynesboro vo voted for it. Really? Waynesboro must have been a really progressive. A bastion of liberalism over it there. It was. <laughs> in, in 1915, it was. Not in Chambersburg. Interesting. No. So what was her association with the National Women's Party? That Alice, that's the uh, party that Alice Paul and Lucy Burns founded. Did she have? She an was part of that. Yes, she was, she was part of that. What was her position in the National uh, Women's Party? I th she was on the board. Okay. Um, the uh, newspaper was, or the newsletter was, the, called the Suffragist, and she was on that board. And she wrote the article that I r quoted from the Younger at the Gates. She wrote that article in 1917 for the Suffragist. Oh, wow! Wow! A, a fascinating story. A fascinating woman. Um, that's all the questions I have for you, but I just want to thank you so much for coming in today, and we'd love to have you back. Uh, maybe we could talk about Myra or okay. some other interesting historical figures. So thank you so much, Anne. Um, thank you. We want to turn it back over to our producer, Jeremy. Jeremy, what have you got for us? Thanks, Pete, and thank you, Anne. What a great show today. Before we go, just a couple of events we should mention. The Franklin County Coalition for Progress is holding its next Common Grounds Gathering on Saturday, April 14th from 10 till noon in the Conservatory at the Coyle Library. The speaker for April will be Dr. Sarah Grove, a political science professor from Shippensburg University. She'll be talking about the ins and outs of local and state government. More information on that and other coalition events can be found at FCCforprogress.org. Also, because our guest here today came to us from the Franklin County Historical Society, we thought we'd mention their upcoming escape room events held at the old jail in downtown Chambersburg. Teams of six to eight try to break out of the 1880 jail with the gold bar by using clues and solving puzzles. Various time slots are available in April and May. Call 717-264-1667 for all the details and visit the Historical Society online at franklinhistorical.org. Thanks for listening. Send us your thoughts and ideas to progresspod at gmail.com. Visit us online at progresspod.org and follow us on Twitter. We're at The Progress Pod. <laughs>